Hey, everybody. Hope you all are doing well and welcome back. And yes, it is that time again, the end of the month of January this time. And that means that it's time for us to do our January haul of the top bottles. There's eight of them in total, totaling $1,159.92 that we added to the collection this month. And uh, we really have some great ones for sure. Now, we left out some of the other ones because I don't know if anyone wants to <laughs> watch me drink Bushmills. Uh, but these are the top bottles we added for this month. So today, we're going to go over the best bottles we got, including one unicorn, uh, where we got them from, talk about their prices, and why we decided to add them to the collection. Now, uh, if you like the Wanders, if you like the reviews, if you like the hauls, if you like all the great stuff we got cooking up for you, and we got tons of great stuff cooking up for you, don't forget to like and subscribe. Um, it really helps out the channel, and you get notifications when our newest videos come out on Sundays, and sometimes in between. Or right, now, let's get down to the video. All right, real quick, uh, let's do a quick whiskey check for today. And today, I'm gonna be enjoying a little bit of something Japanese, which is this Yamazaki 12. Uh, it is delicious. It is actually Japanese, and <laughs> I can't help trying to buy it every time I see it. It's got like a Pavlovian like response to it. So the only sad thing is there's no pop. It's just a top twist off. So I'll get a little juice for myself here. Yeah. And to whiskey, because really, honestly, you can never drink too much of it. You can only just drink it too fast. Cheers. Oh, ooh, that's good. All right, so we're gonna start this one off with a bang, with our first bottle, which is a unicorn. It is coveted and was completely an unexpected surprise, which is this Van Winkle 13. Ooh, just look at the bottle. <laughs> Not too close. <laughs> But it is a, a pretty cool looking bottle. It's got a very nice old timey feel to it. So we got this bottle basically 100% by luck. We just happened to win it in a lottery at one of our local grocery stores. And they called us up and we went down and we bought it. There was no schmoozing. There was no fuss. There was no mess. There's no fighting with anybody. There's no camping overnight and freezing all your toes off. Nothing like that. It was just kind of, I guess, the way it used to be back in the day. Uh, but I was super excited to get it. Uh, that being said, this is one of the rarer members of the Van Winkle family. Technically, it is not a Pappy Van Winkle, um, but we are still super happy to have it added to the collection. It is ABV'd at 95.6 uh, proof, so 47.8%, uh, which is is pretty good, right? It's, it's definitely uh, going to get you going where you want to go. We got it for an astounding price at $119.99, which is basically right on the MSRP for it. So, I mean, frankly, basically they're paying us to take it away off their hands. Um, and obviously it's aged 13 years. It is a rye-based version of the Van Winkle family whiskey, which I think is, again, what makes it sort of unusual. And this one will definitely ascend to the very top shelf of of the bar and of the collection. Again, super excited to have this one. Happy to have it part of our collection and as our first Van Winkle family member. Oh, so I'm really excited, just ecstatic to uh, try it out here in the not so distant future to see if it actually meets the hype. And now, unfortunately means you gotta save up uh, for all the rest of the family. So he doesn't get so lonely. Also, we did a video about how we want it. So if you wanna take a look at that, I'll put a link up here for that. If you're just curious what that process looks like. Uh, so that is the Van Winkle 13 and it is going to be delicious. Now the number two bottle on the list uh, is one that uh, actually the wife surprised me with. Uh, she had found it at a local liquor store here and was real quick on the draw uh, and was able to get it before <laughs> you know all the rest of the peat heads from the area were able to pick it up, which is this Ardbeg Hypernova which is yet another very cool label. It's almost got like a Twilight Zone feel to it. That's very, very cool. Now, of course, for a person who loves the taste of a forest fire, and unfortunately it happens here in CA a lot more often than you would think, but I do like the aftermath. This whiskey is exactly what the doctor would order. Now, according to Arbeg, it is the smokiest version that they have ever put out uh, and has a peated phenolic level of 170 P. PM, which I don't know anything about it, but it does sound like a lot. And I would imagine, uh, you know, I almost guarantee you're probably going to get kicked off an airplane if you open this one up on a flight. Also, it is a committee release, which means that it is crafted with the combined input from the Ardbeg committee, Ardbeg embassies, and probably a bunch of Ardbeg fanboys uh, from around the world. 
Uh, the one thing I really like about this one, aside from the super duper extraordinarily peatiness, is the ABV is at uh, 51%, uh, which means that and not only will it leave you uh, tasting smoke, <laughs> but you'll also be spitting a little bit of fire too. So it's not as underpowered as many of the other Isla peated scotch that uh, we all know and love and hover around, I don't know, 43%. I'm looking at you, Lagavulin. <laughs> Um, but, uh, you know, they are good too as well, um, but they lack the little extra punch that hopefully this Hypernova uh, Arbeg is going to have. Now, we got this one for $199.99, and we added it to the collection because, well, I mean, first of all, <laughs> I really like Ardbeg in its kind of normal general form, along with its uh, county mates, you know, Lagavulin, Coli, and some of the other Isla whiskeys that are known for being heavily peated. But uh, for this one specifically, I thoroughly enjoy the smokiness and the really unabashed approach that Ardbeg takes with its whiskey. And again, who doesn't want the smokiest version of basically any whiskeys? Also, it looks super cool. I like the psychedelic colors, uh, the, the, you know, the Twilight Zone feel to it. And I'm imagining that's what you're going to be seeing if you drink enough of it. <laughs> so um, this is the Ardbeg Hypernova. I am really excited to have it. Uh, I like its whimsicalness to it as well. And uh, hopefully we're going to pop it open here at some point in the near future and give it a comparison to some of the other Islas and even some of the other Ardbegs that we already have. And uh, we know that this one will probably probably be the, the top level peat that we can work our way up to. So that is the Ardbeg Hypernova. All right, the number three uh, here that we're gonna talk about um, in this haul uh, is going to be the Michter's Bourbon, Michter's 10 Bourbon. And that is a very cool bottle as well. I love the shape of it. It feels very, very fancy. You see it on the bar, it looks super nice, right? <laughs> It's just very cool. Um, this one we actually included earlier this month in our What's in the Box video, um, and, and along with its fraternal twin, the Rye, the Michter's 10 Rye. And we bought them both overseas and had them both shipped to us because, I mean, really, honestly, Michter's is a pretty hard to find here and double that uh, to try to find it at a semi-reasonable price. Now, obviously, this one is aged 10 years old. It is the bourbon version, um, and it is from 2021 because I don't believe they actually made a bourbon or at least put one out in 2022. Uh, the bottle number on it on the neck tag is at uh, L21D114, if y'all can see that. Um, which, again, would indicate that it is from 2021. Um, and the ABV on it is at 47.2%. And it comes with one of my favorite accoutrements that comes with a lot of the bottles, this one as well as the Blanton's, uh, which is the fishnet. <laughs> it always gets me. I like the fishnet. Now, this Michter's 10 is distilled from corn and then aged in American white oak barrels and then is mellowed by the proprietary Michter's signature filtration, <laughs> whatever that is. Probably run it through a couple socks. Um, but we did buy this one overseas and had it shipped to us, uh, so that means that it is actually only a 700 milliliter bottle. Uh, I, can see, I just can see it there. It is actually only a 700 milliliter bottle, which always makes me, you know, a little sad and feel a little cheated. But uh, we decided to get the Mictors 10 because, uh, well, earlier this year, or maybe it was last year, I guess last year at this point, we had the pleasure of trying the Mictors 20 uh, in Paris, the wife and I. It was amazing. And since we didn't want to spend DuckTales money on getting a 20-year-old Mictors, well, we bought the 10 to see if it kind of soothes that itch and see if it can scooch by our senses uh, and uh, maybe daydream about it being a 20 or might be even great on its own. So that is the Michter's 10 Bourbon. Again, super excited to have it part of the collection. Now, next up is another one uh, from our What's in the Box video. It was also uh, shipped over and roomated with the, the Michter's, <laughs> which is this E.H. Taylor single barrel. And there's nothing that just excites me more than a tall yellow silo filled with whiskey. These things, see these, it always makes me a little crazy. Now, first of all, I need to make a correction from the last video, because I had said that E.H. Taylor, uh, the man, not the whiskey, was a true full bird colonel from back in the day. And I'll tell you what, I was wrong. I was wrong, 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 100,000%. In fact, I had made fun of Colonel Sanders saying that E.H. Taylor was a colonel and Colonel Sanders was not from KFC. Um, but it actually turns out that Colonel Sanders was actually awarded a title of colonel by the governor of Kentucky. So he's actually much more of a colonel than E.H. Taylor, which I guess is a title that the governor of Kentucky is apparently able to do, to add to people. And uh, Colonel E.H. Taylor, well, I guess he probably just liked the way it looked in front of his name. Now, that aside, I love E.H. Taylor 
I just love E.H. Taylor. It's one of my favorite lines out of the entirety of Buffalo Trace. And I like the fact that it sort of flies under the radar from some of the more well-known and more hyped bourbons like the Weller or the Pappies or the Blantons. Um, but you know what? It is just as hard to find. It's another whiskey that is uh, not easy to find, especially if you're looking for something that is above the small batch. Now, even though it is ABV at the normal small batch amount at 50% uh, ABV, it is bottled in bond as well. Um, it, it, you know, I think we got this one because it'll be super interesting to see how it fares against the small batch. Obviously, for the small batch, they blend multiple barrels together to create a small batch profile that Buffalo Trace desires. But my hope is that with a single barrel, um, it's going to present perhaps a quirkier or maybe more idiosyncratic version of E.H. Taylor as each barrel has its own inconsistencies, which can cause the whiskey to be aged differently and have a different flavor, and it's not blended together and kind of flattened out where some of those curves are. So I'm really hoping that the single barrel may have its own unique personality within that E.H. Taylor genre. Now the mash bill on this one is at 75% uh, corn, 10% rye, and 15% barley, uh, which is exactly the same as the normal E.H. Taylor small batch and is known as the Buffalo Trace mash bill numero uno. Now we got this one for $123.73, again from overseas with the Mictors. Um, and I think it's a pretty reasonable price. And like the Mictors and the Ardbegs and the Pappies, <laughs> which we just kind of started right now with that first one, um, you know, E.H. Taylor is another wing of the collection that we want to work our way up the ladder and try from the very lowest level at the small batch, the entry level, all the way up to uh, eventually, hopefully, fingers crossed, something like a Warehouse C and see how it changes throughout those different iterations. So, and then compare them next to each other. That'll be cool too. So either way, E.H. Taylor, single barrel, super excited to have this one. All right, so the next one that we got up is, I guess it would be number five, is this Booker's Pinky's Batch. Uh, it is the blue label. Um, it is the 2022-4, so it is the last version they came out with uh, last year, I guess, for 2022. <laughs> Take a look at that. It looks pretty cool. And uh, honestly, buying these things has almost started to become uh, habitual since Booker's comes out with a new batch basically every quarter. It's like a never ending cycle, which means that if we keep buying them when they keep coming out, we'll end up with mountains and mountains of bourbons that are unique, that are varied and are interesting. And I guess that's bad. <laughs> Either way, we pick this one up uh, from one of our local Total Wines here in LA. And as you can see, we already got a nice little collection going that includes things like the Little Book, um, which was honestly a little underwhelming. Uh, I'll put the review here for it as well. Um, as well as some of the other ones. But the Pinky's Batch is kind of a homage uh, to Frederick Booker No, who was Booker No's dad. Although uh, he was not in the bourbon business, he was a banker, uh, this batch was made in his honor. Anyways, the bourbon is aged six years, 10 months, and 10 days. And it comes in at a very healthy ABV of 61.2%, which uh, should at least raise an eyebrow for those of you fire breathers out there. And we bought it for $93.99. Uh, and I think that I am thoroughly Pavlovian on this one as well, kind of like with the Yamazaki, because whenever I see the newest bookers come out, just have to buy it. Just don't even think, just buy it. And you know, maybe with all these boxes I have by the end, we'll be able to make a, a nice little hut or something out of it. But we decided to add this one to the collection because more so than most, the other whiskeys we are collecting, Booker's is consistently updating and changing their whiskey, which makes comparing them so, so interesting and short of sort lived and really ultimately pretty special. Now this next one that we got uh, was from a Las Vegas Total Wine. Uh, you can check out the video, I'll put that up. And uh, I'm pretty sure, <laughs> I'm pretty sure that we got bamboozled on it. Um, because the salespeople were all like claiming in chorus in time that it is a viable alternative to Blanton's, which uh, was completely unprompted. So I guess I guess maybe I look like a, a Blanton's uh, a lover or a whiskey lover or a bourbon lover. And you know what? They were right. Also, as I have gone more and more to more Total Wines, um, it becomes pretty apparent that Total Wines as a company, <laughs> they bought a lot of this Hancock Reserve. I mean, a lot, a lot of the Hancock Reserve. And it seems like they're really trying to dump it. They're trying to get rid of it as quickly as possible, uh, likely for good reasons. 
Now, this one actually is part of the Buffalo Trace family. Um, it has the same mash bill, mash bill number two, the high rye version that uh, its uh, other family members have. So that could be um, the Blantons or Elmer T. Lee, Rock Hill Farms, and a couple other ones. Um, but it is definitely underpowered. Uh, you can see here that the ABV on it is at 88.9 uh, proof. So that's 44.45%. Uh, and from all accounts, it is not uh, well balanced. It is not well known. Uh, and it's definitely not sprinkled with whatever that is, that special sauce that Buffalo Trace tends to put on their bourbons that make them phenomenal, at least some of them. Now, that being said, I am still happy to have it. And I think it'll be a great candidate for one of our is it better than Blanton's, even though the answer may already be a foregone conclusion. And, uh, you know, I'm not really expecting for this one to knock my socks off, but it will be great to try. And uh, I'll keep an open mind <laughs> as much as I can. And we'll sort of see what it tastes like to have a Buffalo Trace flop. All right, so for the second to last whiskey is one that I am probably most stupidly excited about. I mean, sure, the Van Winkle 13, great. And, of course, I'm happy that I have it in the collection. I feel like, you know, I, I get to be a part of the Van Winkle Club now. Yay, you know, get my get our T-shirts. Um, but is this Hardin's Creek... 15 <laughs> which i don't know i'm just super excited about it it's kind of kind of a maybe it's like the the container it looks cool you get to like open it up right uh and it's got kind of a, a cool ambiance to it so this one is actually the second and much harder to find version of the duo that came out from jim beam uh, the first one is the Harden creek colonel james beam oh you know what i think i have one here which is this one and you can obviously see the resemblance uh, for them so this is the Colonel James Beam. And I, I don't know if he was a real Colonel or not, by the way. <laughs> Just I don't want to get into that trap as well. But it's supposed to be a Lux product uh, from Beam. Um, this one, though, the Colonel James Beam, is only two, aged two years. Um, and with the leather, leather strap on there, you know, it kind of really makes me think it's going to be a bit more hat than it is cowboy. Now, that being said, the Hardens Creek, uh, that is Jacob's Well, this is the 15-year-old version of it. Um, is actually named after the first distiller of the Beam family, Jacob Beam, and I guess obviously a well that he built in 1795, is actually, again, aged 15 years. And obviously it is more mature, it is definitely more rare, and it is considerably more expensive um, out of the duo, which uh, turns out to make it obviously to me more interesting one because it is 15 years old which is sort of rare for bourbon although less so nowadays you have like the calumet 15 the knob creek has a 15 also beam um and the pappy has a 15 uh, years old bourbon so it's definitely getting uh less uh uncommon but it's still definitely getting into a gerency at least for bourbon which i think is a good thing up to a point and up to a price. Now, more specifically, this version of the Hardens Creek, the Jacobs Well, is actually aged specifically 15 years and four months and was produced in 2022. And it has a very healthy ABV of 54% ABV. And you can see that there. In the tasting notes, it does emphasize that there is an extra oakiness that goes along with it. Specifically, when compared with its cousin, Knob Creek 15, it is also found to be richer, at least in that one person's opinion. And although there is a slight difference in age, I'll be really interesting to see how it compares with another whiskey that is known to be overly oaky as well, which is the Elijah Craig 18. So I think it'll be a good counterpoint to that one as well. Either way, picking up, I mean, it's kind of a no-brainer. 15 years from Beam, sort of a special release, and of course, <laughs> I'm going to get it. So it, it can add to the Beam side of the collection. Again, see how those familial traits express themselves in various renditions. So I'm excited to have this one. It's a little gaudy with the little strap and the story and everything, but in the, <laughs> in the booklet that it comes with. Um, but you know what? Still happy to have it, and it'll be a great counterbalance to some of the other Beams to fill out that side of the collection. Now, last but not least, and I'll keep this one short uh, because it's starting to run a little long, is going to be the Michter's 10 Rye, which we picked up along with its uh, fraternal brother, the Michter's 10 Bourbon uh, from overseas. We added this one because, uh, again, we wanted to have another bottle to bring down the shipping cost, <laughs> which is one. Uh, and two is because I really enjoy rye. And three, you know what? I think it's delicious. I think it's going to be delicious. So um, it was a bit more expensive than the uh, the bourbon version. So it was uh, $205. And the bottle number on it is uh, L21E1524. Or maybe that's a nine. Hmm. 
Uh, it's aged 10 years, and this one was also from 2021, at least, again, judging from the neck tag. So well, I'm really excited to have uh, this one uh, because it can show how Michter's uh, as a whiskey begins to change when the rye is factored in, and we can compare it against the standard bourbon line, the standard 10 line. So, uh, you know, uh, oh, you know what, for that matter, we could also compare it to the Shanks and the Bomburgers as well. Hmm, interesting. So yeah, again, excited to have it. It was great to uh, bring down the cost of the bottles and it's great to have another Michter's. So that is the Michter's 10. All right, so that's it for today. And as you can see, we are steadily trying to build up the collection in some specific lines of bourbon, uh, but we want it ultimately to be well-rounded, albeit <laughs> bourbon heavy. Uh, and we still got some great scotches, like the Ardbeg is, uh, is, is pretty amazing as well, uh, a nice find. Um, but what makes all this amazing is going to be when we finally start to have the chance to comparing them side by side and truly get an insightful notion of what bourbon and rye and scotch as a corpus uh, really entails, what they can be and how they can change from one house of bourbon to another. So thanks again for watching. And if you like these videos, if you like the wanders, the hauls, the reviews, the unbottlings, the unboxings, and really all the amazing stuff we got cooking up for you, and we got a lot, <laughs> don't forget to like and subscribe. Um, it really does help out our channel. It pleases the whiskey gods, and you get notifications when our newest videos come out on Sundays and sometimes in between. So with that, uh, I just remember, if you do find a whiskey that you love, just buy it. Because if you don't, Somebody else surely will. In this case, it might even be me. All right, everybody, I'm out. Have a great rest of your week, and adios.